Okay, so this is a brand new lecture. Uh, if you want to call it anything, you can call it photosynthesis. So we've gone through cellular respiration and we've gone through fermentation. And cellular respiration, fermentation are all about producing ATP from glucose. If we want the system as a whole to work, we're going to need a continuous supply of glucose. Okay? So we need to be able to produce glucose that can be consumed by consumers like us, many of the animals around us. And we're going to get the glucose. We're going to get the glucose from what are called autotrophs or producers. And so these are organisms, things like plants and photosynthetic bacteria, that are really good at taking energy from some source, typically the sun, which is the ultimate energy source, using that to build precursor molecules that then can go into a second metabolic pathway to generate glucose. And then you consume either the plant directly as a consumer, or you consume a consumer that consumes the plant. So maybe you go and have a salad today, and you're getting that glucose to that plant, that poor, innocent lettuce, produced on its own, and you're going to steal it as you kill that plant. Burger. Or you're going to eat a hamburger and that poor defenseless cow that consumed that poor defenseless grass has now extracted the glucose and has glucose available in its muscles and other locations. And then you consume that cow as a hamburger and you pick up those glucose molecules from there. So how do we actually generate glucose? How do we supply glucose to the entire system? Uh, so with energy production, we are going to convert energy from the sun. Uh, energy from the sun which we cannot use. If you go stand in the sun, you're going to get nothing more than a sunburn. You're not going to produce any of your own glucose. You're going to have some other things that happen that are beneficial, but no energy can be generated by you to be from the sun. Energy that the sun can actually take some of that energy away? Well, the sun can have effects on changing um, your genetics, and it can cause mutations, which can cause some of these enzymes to not work as efficiently. The sun's still really important, though, because there's um, calcium homeostasis is actually regulated through sunlight. So it's not like the sun is completely, you don't need the sun at all, stay inside. You actually still can use the UV light for certain metabolic pathways. We can talk about those in the AMP if you ever take that class. But to get glucose, which is going to be our energy supply, we can convert the energy of the sun to a usable form. If we are an organism that's set up with the right enzymes to be able to do this. So that usable form is really going to be glucose, and it's going to be what is the primary input for cellular respiration. So you need energy. You break down glucose to produce that energy that you can use for all of the metabolic processes. But you need the glucose from somewhere, and you're going to get that from, ultimately, the sun by way of photosynthesis through producers that can generate the glucose. Again, those producers are called autotrophs. And the autotrophs produce energy to generate, or by way of generating raw materials to build glucose. Okay. So photosynthesis, the end product of photosynthesis is actually not going to be glucose. We get a molecule that we've already seen, glyceraldehyde uh, 3 phosphate, which is middle of the glycolytic pathway. It's a three-carbon molecule. We're actually going to produce 
G3P through photosynthesis, and that G3P is going to be, you take a couple G3Ps and you can put them together to form glucose. So in this kind of whole biological system, we have the autotrophs, including plants, also photosynthetic bacteria that take raw material to generate that usable form of energy in glucose. And then we have you and I and other uh, other consumers. Those are going to be heterotrophs. And again, the heterotroph is either going to consume the photosynthetic organism itself, or it's going to consume the consumers of photosynthetic organisms. And we happen to be a type of organism that typically does both, unless you're a vegetarian, in which case you're just weird. So primarily I'm going to focus on the plants and how plants accomplish this production of glucose. And so we need to start out with just a little bit of green plant anatomy. So what you're looking at here in this picture is basically a cross-section, a three-dimensional representation of, uh, of a leaf that we might find in a leafy green plant. So when you begin to look at this leaf, what you see is I basically have two layers of tissue, the cuticle and the upper epidermis. And then down here, if this is the bottom of the leaf, I have the cuticle and the lower epidermis. And those two tissue layers sandwich in a bunch of other things, xylem and phloem and the palisade mesophyll cells. I also have these spongy mesophyll cells. So the description that I'm going to give you here is the leaf is a sandwich layers of tissue. You've got cuticle and epidermis cells on both sides and then the stuff that's in the middle. Now the upper and lower epidermis. These are going to contain, there's going to be some very similar sounding words as we go through here, so I'm going to try to emphasize these as best as possible. So the upper and lower epidermis, they contain these things called stoma. Another word that you're going to hear is stroma. So stroma and stoma. Stoma is going to be the pores S-T-O-M-A, these are pores or openings between the cells of the epidermis. Now these pores, they exist to allow gas permeation. So the pores allow CO2 and oxygen to move through the plant, through the leaf. The experiment that you did with the spinach. The spinach would have a very similar anatomical structure as you see here. Remember you used the syringe to induce pressure on those, on those little um, pieces of the, of the spinach leaf? What you were doing is you were using that pressure to basically force the solution into the cell and remove all of the gas. All right, so inside the sandwich of epidermis, you have all this other stuff. You're going to have these mesophyll cells. And really, the whole thing can be called a mesophyll tissue. You have two different types, the palisade mesophyll cells and then the spongy mesophyll cells. These are in the middle. That's what meso means, is in the middle. And these are the cells that contain the 
photosynthetic enzymes and the photosynthesis chemistry. So the photosynthetic cells. In addition to those mesophyll cells, you also have, they're referred to as veins. They contain bundle sheet cells, the xylem, and the phloem. This is just like our veins in mammalian physiology, in mammalian anatomy. that allows the tissue of the mesophyll to be penetrated by these veins, and they will allow nutrient movement. And the big one is to move water from the roots, and then the sugars that are being produced here in the leafy part of the plant down to the roots for growth and energy and all that. Remember that the cells of plants, they still contain mitochondria, right? Because even though they're producing glucose, they still need to be able to produce ATP. So they still have the capability to go through fermentation and cellular respiration. So they use the glucose that they're producing to produce the ATP that's needed for growth and regulation and cellular development and all that kind of stuff. So we're generating the glucose here in the mesophyll. We use the veins to transport the glucose down to the roots to supply the roots that require energy that they need and to make sure those cells are able to grow. Now, a tree really grows, or a plant really grows in two different, two different directions. You get water from the roots, but you get the sun that comes down on the leaves. And we're going to need water. We're going to find that we're going to need some water. We're going to need oxygen, which comes from the air. And we're going to need the sunlight, which comes out of space in the atmosphere. So water comes up from the roots from the soil. Sunlight comes in from, uh, the, from outer space. And then the oxygen comes in from the air. All of these three different locations supply the raw nutrients that are required for photosynthesis to happen. So really, the, the, in terms of photosynthesis, the, the most important thing that's happening here is in, in the mesophyll. And so I want to talk little bit more detail about the mesophyll. One of the things that we're going to find inside of the mesophyll is this weird looking organelle right here called the chloroplast. So the cells in the mesophyll where photosynthesis is going to occur, those cells are going to contain that membrane bound organelle called the chloroplast. And what you can see is not only do they have an inner and an outer membrane, just like we saw in the mitochondria, but they have this system inside called the thylakoid system. So the chloroplasts, they have inner and outer membranes. In between those two membranes, they're also going to have that intermembranous space, just like we saw in mitochondria. Okay, what were the pores in the in the uh, upper and lower epidermis? What were those called? Stoma. S T O M A. Inside of the chloroplast, there's going to be a fluid in there. That inner fluid of the chloroplast is called stroma, S-T-R-O-M-A, stroma. Stoma is the pore, stroma is the fluid of the chloroplast. And then we're also going to find inside of the chloroplast 
that thing called the thylakoid system. Now, the thylakoid system, you have these stacks, kind of look like stacks of pancakes, and then you're going to have these little bridges or these little connections. In reality, the thylakoid system actually adds a third membrane into the chloroplast. So you have the inner and the outer membrane with the space. Then you have that fluid there called the stroma. And then you have the stacks of the thylakoid system that are a membrane, uh, type of membrane. And then the, the lamellae here, the stroma lamellae, these are the kind of the bridges between those individual thylakoid stacks uh, structures. So the thylakoid system is these membranous sacs, uh, or stacks, I should say, called the grana. So these are the grana, and then the grana are connected through the stroma lamellae. Photosynthesis. We have our light source. It could be the lights in the room or it could be the sun. That sun sends down little packets of light. They're called photons. Photons are really weird. Okay? Light is a very weird thing because not only does it act like a particle, it also acts like a wave. The photon is a description of the packet, and then the wave can be described through the wavelength. Visible light is between 400 nanometers, which is violet, and 700 nanometers, which is red. So the photon of light, as it moves like a little packet, it's associated with a wave of different widths. Based off of the width of the wave, the wavelength is going to dictate what color the light is, if it's within that visible spectrum. Okay. So keep those two things in mind. Packets of light filled photons that have waves that are going to be between 400 and 700 nanometers in width. So here is, this is the chloroplast. So inner and outer membrane, the inner membrane of space, and then we have the grana of the thylakoid system. Sunlight over here, oxygen is going to be released, CO2 is going to be required. And when you look at photosynthesis, the term photosynthesis is actually referring to two different things inside of the cell. You're going to have two pathways. One of them is going to be photo, and one of them is going to be synthesis. So photosynthesis is made up of two different systems. One is going to be around, uh, centered around the thylakoid system, and guess what? It's an electron transport system. So we're going to see some electron transport genes very similar to what we've already seen with cellular respiration. Then you're going to have this cycle here. It's called, uh, typically called the Kelvin cycle or the C3 cycle. Uh, very similar to the Krebs cycle, not exactly the same, but we're going to have um, the molecules that are being produced, in particular G3P, which is going to slide off and eventually become glucose to a secondary metabolic pathway. Okay, so those two pathways for photosynthesis, we have the light reaction, which is the photo part of photosynthesis. And then we have the Kelvin cycle, which is the synthesis part of photosynthesis. So two pathways, light reaction and the Kelvin cycle. Photo and synthesis. Photo because we're using visible light to cause this portion to do its job. And the Kelvin cycle is synthesis because this is where we're actually producing the G2P that we're going to use to produce our glucose molecule. 
or at least our initial G3P that then is going to be utilized to make the glucose. All right. So notice that I have oxygen that's being generated. I have CO2 that I'm pulling in from the environment. I have water that I'm pulling in up from the roots. And then I have my photons of light that are coming in from the sun. So there's my three ingredients. By the way, let's take a pause here real quick and think back on some of the stuff that we've already talked about. How do electrons determine their potential energy? Um, okay, what's that? Position. Position. And position around what? Atomic nucleus. And what do we call the positions? Nope. The orbital is the statistical description of where the electrons may be within space. Energy shifts. So that second layer of description, which details the energy content of that electron. So the further away you are from the atomic nucleus, more energy, right? So what if I can take an electron that's really, really close to the nucleus, and I can excite it out a couple of energy shells? What's happening? Say that again, Tate. I've increased my potential energy. Now, what happens if the reason that I'm moving that electron out the energy shell is because I'm energizing it from the sun. I'm taking light energy and I'm converting it into chemical energy. The whole point of photosynthesis, especially this light reaction, is to excite electrons to jump up an energy shell because I gain potential energy. Then, when I gain that potential energy because of the sun being put in to make the electron more excited, if I reposition that electron, I have a new potential energy. The old potential energy minus the new potential energy is the free energy or the kinetic energy that can go into doing work, like maybe producing G3D. Okay, does that make sense? So what we're going to be doing here with photosynthesis is we're going to organize it so that we can shift electrons to help them gain potential energy to convert the light energy that's not usable by a, by, by a biological system into chemical energy that is utilizable by a, by, by a biological system. What? Okay, so let's take a look at the light reaction. So in the chloroplast, you have two different places that this is occurring. You have uh, that photosynthesis is occurring. You have the light reaction that's occurring within the thylakoid system, and then you have the Kelvin cycle that's occurring within the stroma. What's the name of the of the force? Stoma. So in the stroma, which is the liquid inside the fluid inside of the chloroplast. All right, so we are taking a look. Remember the grana of the thylakoid system, what are they? They are membranous stacks. This is a lipid bilayer. So as I jump in, here's my lipid bilayer. We're just looking at one small patch of that grana's membrane. And bound up in there, you can see that we have these things called PS2 and PS1. PS stands for photosystem. Photosystem 2, photosystem 1. And then I have this series of other things that are trapped up in the membrane. One of them is called cytochrome. The other one is called ubiquinolone. And then I have plastocyan. These are components of an electron transport chain. A little bit different electron transport chain than we saw in cellular respiration, but it still functions very much the same way. We're going to move electrons through that electron transport chain over from photosystem 2 to photosystem 1, and then we're going to use another little electron transport chain. And look at what we're doing. We're actually still pumping hydrogen in. That hydrogen goes down. Ooh, an old familiar friend, ATP synthase. 
So hydrogen passes through ATP synthase, and the catalytic knob spins, taking ADP and inorganic phosphate and converting it into ATP. Also notice that as that electron goes through, creating my proton motive force, or moving my, uh, my hydrogen into the lumen of the thylakoid. So this is the stroma here, the lumen of the thylakoid here. This is the inside of that thylakoid, of that grana. Notice that as the electron moves through, that that electron is eventually going to be passed off to this molecule called NADP. Not NAD+, plus, but very similar. It's actually NAD plus a phosphate. Then we get NADP. That electron comes through, reduces NADP to form NADPH. And so I'm going to get some usable products here out of my light reaction, NAD and NAD, or NADPH and ATP. So the first step here in photosynthesis, the light reaction, is to generate NADPH and ATP. And we're going to use electron transport chain and an ATP synthase to accomplish the task. Notice, by the way, water through photosystem 2, water is what's going to donate the, the electron to replace the electron that gets excited by the light. This light comes in and it excites an electron to pop it into the electron transport chain. And why does it pop into the electron transport chain? Why do electrons move in any, for any reason? Because they're going towards a higher and higher electronegativity. So they're being pulled through by that electronegativity. So water is used to donate an electron that generates the oxygen. This is going to eventually make its way back out into the environment as a waste product, so to speak. Light causes an electron to pop off of photosystem 2. That electron that's lost from photosystem 2 is replaced because we break water apart to donate that electron. Okay, I'm going to get into all of this in more detail. I'm just trying to give you the big overview right now. So the light reaction, it occurs in the thylakoid membrane. Our light from the sun is what is going to cause all of this to begin. And it's because that light is going to act like a photon. Now, the term photon is referring to the fact that light can act as just a little packet of energy. How many of you ever seen those little things that kind of look like a, a light bulb? And on the inside, there's this little, it, it basically has four different little um, fins on it. One side is white, the other side is black. You put it in the window, that thing will just spin around. You know what I'm talking about? We have one next door over there. So it usually has a base, and it looks kind of like this. And then there's this thing up here that has these little fins on it. One side is white and the other side is is black. And there's usually four of them. So if you look at it from the top, it sort of looks something like this. No one has ever seen these. A lot of times little kids will have them in their room with a little toy. I think there's a class in there. So when light comes in, it hits the dark side and it begins to cause that thing to spin. So the light literally comes in as a little packet of energy and transports and it hits the darker side that, that energy is transferred from the light to rotate so it becomes mechanical energy as it rotates that little that little thing. Seriously? Have you ever seen the Cartesian diver? What the heck did you guys do with this? What is that thing called? I don't know what it's called. <laughs> you said play baseball? Played outside. Yeah, I played outside with my Cartesian diver. Or my or my rocket. 
Did anyone have BB guns? Yes. Yeah. Shut my brother. Only once? <laughs> Both Multiple times. Yeah, we have BB gun works too, but one of my really good friends has still got a BB stuck up here in this head before he shot. Anyways. I don't know, I think you guys need to go and buy some more toys. It's a little... It's a terrible excuse. <laughs> so light acts as a photon. It has, it's a little packet of energy. And we can't feel it because it's so small. But when it interacts with an electron, which is really, really small, one twelfth out, or one twelve hundredth of a... Um, of a Dalton, it is going to be able to shift the energy from the photon, that little packet of light, to the electron to shift it up an energy shift to reposition. So, this picture here, photosystem two and photosystem one, they look similar to this. And you can see that we have these little tiny, they're called antenna pigment molecules. These contain electrons, and when that photon of light comes in, it interacts with one of those antenna pigment molecules. It causes the electron to begin to bounce around until we get to this place called the reaction center. And there's a chlorophyll molecule. So these pigment molecules, these are chlorophyll. One of those is a special chlorophyll at the reaction center that when an electron bumps on there, it's enough energy to transfer its electron onto this thing called the primary electron acceptor. The electron, as it's bumping around and hopscotching around until it gets to the primary electron acceptor, it's changing position, it's changing its energy shell. So the little packet of light comes in and it begins to cause in that chlorophyll molecule, those electrons to begin to reposition into new energy shifts. So the chlorophyll is a pigment. And anytime you hear the word pigment, think of being able to respond to light. Your skin color is based off of the pigment melanin that is present responding to light to generate the different tones of skin color. Chlorophyll is a pigment that responds to light inside of photosynthetic organisms, including plants. So the chlorophyll, the pigment, is able to absorb light. It's able to take that packet of energy and is able to grab that energy from that packet. And it does it at some very specific wavelengths. So it does it at very specific wavelengths. Why is a why is a scientific degree? It's the color it reflects. So that means that green light is not going to really be all that good at absorbing into the chlorophyll. So we're actually going to use light that's a lot closer to red and orange. So red light closer to 700 nanometers, orange light closer to about 680, 650, is going to absorb yellow somewhat. Green and blue and indigo violet, not all of them all that long. Especially not green. Green reflects right back. And so the green light reflects off, isn't absorbed, and that's what you see. That's the wavelength of light that you observe is green. So we're going to have a specific wavelength that absorbs really, really well. And hopefully you're kind of thinking head here a little bit. You're kind of thinking, I bet those two different photosystems, photosystem two and photosystem one, absorb different wavelengths. Perhaps. I'll give you a hint. One of them is called the P680, and one of them is called the P700. 700 nanometers, 680. It's two different wavelengths. 
Okay, so we need that specific leg wavelength. We need the pigment that can absorb that specific wave wavelength. So those pigment molecules when that specific wavelength, that little packet of light that contains energy, the photon, with its specific wavelength, when it hits the pigment, if it's the perfect wavelength, that absorbed light releases its energy or allows its energy to excite an electron. Now, what do you remember about electrons? Do electrons prefer to be in an excited state or a non-excited state? Non-excited. So when an electron gets excited, it jumps up to an energy shell and it becomes more unstable. That electron kind of goes, oh, I want to get back down to my ground state. And the way that it's going to is because it's going to give off its, its energy. And so it passes the energy on to another electron. And as it passes that energy on, it drops back down to a lower energy state where it's, oh, I guess I'm, I'm good here. But that other electron is now going, ah! Ah! <laughs> so that other electron gets excited. Jumps from ground state up to excited state and wants to get back down to ground state. The only way to do it is to pass its energy on. So we move out an energy shell, and typically this means that we change, we move to a new orbital, right? We're moving to a new orbital within a new energy shell. Energy shell one, energy shell two. And so that increases the potential energy. So as that energy is transferred in, that electron jumps up an orbital to a new energy shell, increases its potential energy. And so looking at it as the whole kind of chlorophyll pigment here, that antenna pigment molecule, we say that that chlorophyll transitions from a ground state, which is where the electron wants to be, but because of the additional energy, it transitions out to an excited state. So ground state to excited state. It is going to be that packet of energy that causes the elect one of those first electrons on the chlorophyll molecule to jump over to an excited state. And again, that excited state is very unstable. Electrons don't like to be unstable. They like to be stable. They have to get rid of that energy to drop back down. So in order for the electron to turn the ground, we have to release the energy. Now, as you and I both know, when you release energy, two things happen. A little bit of heat's going to be produced. So we're going to have a little bit of heat, but then we're also going to have another electron that becomes excited. So other electrons on other pigments become excited. And that's what you're seeing here is this transfer of energy. The photon comes in, excites an electron within this chlorophyll. That excited electron goes to its excited state, wants to get back to ground state, and so it releases its energy, 
causes a second, so there's the energy transfer, causes a second electron in another chlorophyll to go to excited state. And then it goes back down to ground state, releasing a little bit of heat in the environment, but also transferring energy to another electron. And so literally what's happening is the energy, we have no electrons exchanging here, but we have energy that is exchanging. And that energy hops along until we get to that reaction center chlorophyll. Now that reaction center chlorophyll is a little bit different than the normal antenna pigment chlorophyll molecules. Because rather than transferring an electron's energy, it actually transfers the electron itself. In other words, what happens to this chlorophyll? It becomes oxidized because we're losing the electron. The electron acceptor here becomes reduced because it's accepting the electron. Now, what would happen if I kept on losing electrons from the reaction center chlorophyll? What would happen to that chlorophyll? I basically begin to lose it because I'm getting rid of all of my matter. I'm getting rid of my electrons. I would cause some real serious problems. So eventually I'm going to have to replace that electron that I lost. So every time I lose the electron, I have to replace it. That's where water's going to come in. So the pigments, all of these chlorophylls, they're going to be associated in the membrane of the chloroplast in a big structure that's going to hold them called a photosystem. So I have this big protein that has these chlorophylls that are associated with it. That's called a photosystem. In addition to the chlorophylls that are being excited as that energy jumps through it, I'm also going to have this one specialized uh, chlorophyll called the uh, reaction center chlorophyll that's going to donate its electron when it gets excited to the primary electron acceptor. Okay, so the primary electron acceptor. This is really the end of the chain for energy transfer within that photosystem. So the end of the chain, the electron is excited by this reaction center chlorophyll to jump to the primary electron acceptor. So the electrons that are excited at that reaction center chlorophyll are passed to the primary electron acceptor. I'm going to abbreviate that as the PEA. Now, that means that that reaction center chlorophyll has just been oxidized. It's lost its electron. And it means that the primary electron acceptor has been reduced. However, this is a low electronegative molecule. And as we move along the photosystem, we are going to increase in electronegativity until we get to a second electron acceptor uh, uh, or a reaction center chlorophyll in a second photosystem. So that primary electron acceptor doesn't like to be reduced, and so it donates the electron to an electron transport chain. Okay, so that electron transport chain is right here, and it ends at photosystem one, where that electron jumps onto the reaction center chlorophyll there. Why can it jump onto that electron, uh, electron uh, the reaction center chlorophyll? 
because it's just lost its electron to its primary electron itself. Does everybody kind of see what's going on here? We're just allowing the electrons to move through the photosystem, through the electron transport chain to the second photosystem. This electron that just has been excited here jumps up to here. This is now oxidized, this is reduced. The way that this gets re-reduced is to release that electron into this electron transport chain. It's pulled through the electron transport chain by increasing electronegativity. So then I get over here and I have in photosystem one, my photon of light starts to excite the electrons. They go from ground state to excited, release the energy to get back down to ground, and they excite another electron in a neighboring chlorophyll antenna molecule. It continues until here, this reaction center chlorophyll bumps off its electron. So now I've lost its electron. It's gaining the electron back because it's coming from that electron transport chain. Over here, when I lose it, I have to pull it from someplace else. That's where it's getting it from the water. It's going to break down the water to create a couple protons, a molecule of oxygen, and then it's going to dump off the electron. By the way, this is basically the reverse right here of cellular respiration. Cellular respiration usually takes the electron, combines the proton with the oxygen to generate water. We're now going into reverse reaction there. All right, on Monday we'll pick up and we'll start talking about how these two photosystems, or what we did talk about, how those two photosystems work together. Okay.